declaring the end from the beginning. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Bear fruit to God that your fruit should remain. Grace to you and peace from the Most High God, our Father, Yahuwah, and our Master, Yahusha HaMashiach. My daughters have been having these prophetic dreams, more so in the last three weeks. I've also been learning how to be still and so to hear the still small voice of the Father for his Ruach to lead and guide me as to the interpretations of these, which I believe I have received and this is why I feel led to make this video. This one dream my daughter had Friday night, December 18th, was short but straight to the point and particularly thought-provoking. In this dream, my daughter was on a Zoom-like platform, and on the other side, speaking to her, was a man in military uniform, and he made this statement with a rhetorical question. He says, we live in a virtual reality. What will you do when the electricity goes out? Now, there's a plethora of researchable information out there that really questions what we perceive as reality. This branch of science called quantum physics or mechanics or what have you, along with today's highly advanced technology and demonstrations shown to us in movies, we are seeing how what was once thought to be highly controversial seems to be the new age that this world is now heading into. The look and feel of the 21st century science is this age of awareness. We are now in the fully digital age when it comes to information systems and digital data is profoundly networked in ways that were simply not possible before. We understand that we don't understand the nature of things. Scientists make statements such as, we are but a subset of a greater reality. It really does shed a layer of understanding to Hebrews 11.3. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of Yah, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Another related Bible reference is 2 Corinthians 5.7, where it says, For we live by faith, not by sight. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. 2 Corinthians 4.18 These verses were hard concepts to grasp, but since the explosion of technologically advanced concepts, these mysteries are now being demystified for those who have been given eyes to see and be able to make connections what seemingly unrelated concepts, but really is all interconnected. So the things that are visible to our three-dimensional space can be understood by looking at the micro of things, for example, within our bodies, and the macro of things, which is in space and in the universe. A quote from Richard Buckminster Fuller defined thought as a relevant set of experiences bounded by macro-irrelevant and micro-irrelevant experiences that are temporarily separated inwardly and outwardly. That's a mouthful, but that really does try to explain the inexplainable. Going back to this idea of living in a virtual reality, does this idea seem fair to you? Do you feel like we're being played on? Or is this part of a spiritual awakening that our physical and spiritual senses are finally opening to the possibilities of transcending this perceived reality? Whereas in times past, we just blended in this world. We were comfortable in our ways, never wanting to leave. Our vision, whether we admit it or not, is limited to this three-dimensional scope. But now that the true dark colors of this world is starting to surface, and those of us who are called to come out of this world, those of us who are called to meet Yahusha in the air, 
is starting to really come to terms that this world is not our own. Romans 8.24 is looked upon with this fresh understanding that it is in this simulation world that we lean more towards our blessed hope. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he can already see? That's Romans 8.24. Now, the way our Mashiach taught us how to pray in Matthew 6 is declared much more louder in our convictions and much more free from any reservations because our eyes are opened more to the greater and more excellent reality of the coming kingdom whose power and glory is founded upon righteousness, truth, and love and that it is becoming more increasingly evident that the rulers of this world is founded upon evil, lies, and fear. And so as we enter the lateness of this hour in this virtual game, the more we learn to handle the word of Yahuwah, who is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents, of the heart. The more we prime ourselves from being purified within our hearts, we are learning more and more to place our trust in the navigational power of the Ruach HaKodesh. A part of the prayer that our Mashiach has taught us how to pray includes these words. Matthew 6, 13 says, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Ever thought about who is leading you to temptation? On the surface, it seems that you are praying not to get led to temptation, as if Yahuwah is purposefully leading us down the path of temptation. But we must discern the spiritual truth. James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by Yahuwah. For Yahuwah cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. James goes on on verse 14, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Brothers and sisters, our own desires leads us down the path of temptation. We choose what we see, and we only see the image that we carry and are familiar with from within. So Yahuwah is not stopping us from going down the path of the temptations that our own desires is leading us to, to allow for purification or trial by fire. You see, this word temptation in Greek is periasmos. It's an experiment, an attempt, a trial, a proving. And yes, the backdrop or the setting of this trial or experiment and proving is called life, the virtual reality. What is the underlying mission? See, under that Greek word is periazo, which means to try whether a thing can be done. What thing? Well, for one, if you have or carry any impurities within your heart, the refining process is designed to remove metals or silver or anything impure that will allow for one's heart to come forth as gold. Another thing that can fit this description of to try whether a thing can be done is when the Most High descended to form mankind out of clay and breathed the breath of life, Yahuwah's Nashama of life. That makes us living souls, individual expressions of the Most High, carrying His image. And with that image comes power of His Ruach. So the thing that is being tried, whether it can be done or not, is to see if we can be proven worthy to be representatives of His power, His Ruach on earth. And so we've been given Yahuwah Spirit, His Nashama, His voice, to guarantee our success because it is his voice that amplifies our voice. And since we're not robots, we need to understand how this union can be collaborated in a loving way. He gave us our own individual souls. Our souls is made up of our heart, our mind, our desires, our free will. This is why he sent his word, his son Yahusha, to rule over our hearts, because without him, we will go to the left or to the right, 
He is the one who leads us on a straight path. Did you know that your heart emits electromagnetic fields that change according to your emotions? You see, science has proven the heart is 500 times electrically stronger than the brain and up to 5,000 times magnetically stronger. So the human heart's magnetic field can be measured up to several feet away from the body. The heart has a system of neurons that have both short and long-term memory. And so the heart sends more information to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. And the electromagnetic signal produced by your heart is registered in the brain waves of people around you. So when we love Yahuwah with all our hearts, by keeping his instructions or his commandments. The voice of Yahuwah breathed into our nostrils, working in union with our own voice. He is the soundtrack of our lives. He gives us the song of victory. He gives us a song every night. His voice in harmony with our voice is what makes up the new song we will sing beautifully, boomingly, with bags of character of the Most High in our tone that is amplified by our testimony in our lives, as well as within the circle of influence that has been allotted to us. Going back to the word temptation, the third Greek word underneath the word temptation is para, which means to learn to know by experience. This is taking the truth of the knowledge of his word and applying it in this simulated environment we all find ourselves in. And by applied knowledge, we are working out our knowledge in an experiential way, which leads to wisdom. So this is really exercising the seven spirits of Yahuwah noted by Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1. You'll notice that the closest to the spirit of Yahuwah is wisdom and understanding. And as if looking at a menorah, you're going to see that the outer branch representing knowledge, which coincides with reverence. So we take from the wisdom of Solomon in Proverbs 1, 7, where he says the reverence of Yahuwah is the beginning of knowledge. So being able to walk in the spirit by exercising the six branches that leads towards the vine of the spirit of Yahuwah, the spirit of knowledge and reverence, the spirit of counsel and might and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, all of which is necessary for us to cross over from this virtual reality to this greater reality of Yahuwah's kingdom that is soon to come. Because under that Greek word, pera is the word peran. Peran means beyond and on the other side. So you can see how by looking at the etymology of the word temptation, gives us insight to the whole process of being able to endure temptation. And so what is the end goal? James 1.12 tells us that blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which Yahuwah has promised to those who love him. The second part of the statement in my daughter's dream that the man in this military uniform had said is one that is meant, I believe, to provoke us into pondering the message he's trying to convey. The fact that he is dressed for combat seems to convey a message specific for the season of warfare that we are in. It's almost like a motivational speech given to an army before battle. And in hearing these words, I right away thought of Ephesians 6, 12. For our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul is basically saying we are no match to what we are up against. So the Most High needs to intervene. Since we live in a virtual reality, we know that this type of technological environment is only made possible with electrification. What if the Most High unplugs the power source and lights go out? All electronics will eventually drain of power. What if the sun amplifies 
its solar winds and the power surge of a geomagnetic storm were to penetrate through our ionosphere, could this much electromagnetic pulse be powerful enough to fry up, melt, or even bring down satellites? Could the sonic boom released from the sun's coronal mass ejection impact telegraph wires, 2G to 5G cell towers, power grids to such an extent that they are rendered powerless? Could a wide-scale blackout give space and the earth and all its inhabitants a time of rest, a time to be able to breathe uninhibited, a time where veiled eyes are lifted up so people can think clearly without the oppression of brain fogs? Could a time of sitting in silence and going into darkness be the merciful hand of Yahuwah for an unprecedented worldwide opportunity to hear the Creator's still small voice, to bring about repentance before our Maker, before the outpouring of the cup of the wrath of Yahuwah. But what about for those who have entered into Yahusha's gate of righteousness, those who have accepted the invitation of our Mashiach to unload heavy burdens upon him so we can be as light as a feather, light enough to be able to stand in the clouds when we meet our Mashiach in the air? What about those hearts who've been purified by fiery trials, having produced the pure essential oil of obedience? Matthew 5.16 says, Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see Yahuwah. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2.15, We are to Yahuwah the pleasing aroma of Mashiach among those who are being saved. That sounds to me like the aroma therapy that we receive through our Mashiach. And the oil that is produced by the distillation of Yahuwah's word in us, producing the oil of gladness, oil of obedience, oil of healing and protection. Moshe says in Deuteronomy 32 2, let my teaching drop as the rain and my speech distill as the dew, as raindrops on the tender herb and as showers on the grass. You see, it's just like how essential oils are extracted through distillation. The steam with essential oil passes through a cooling system. So it's like when we abide in the secret place or in the garden of delight of the Most High, where we walk with Him in the coolness of the day. It's like the steam condensing into a liquid consisting of essential oil and water, the washing of the Word of Yah. And since we know that oil is lighter than water, the essential oil then floats to the top of the water, just like Peter walking on water with his eyes set on the Messiah. Because Peter, for a brief moment, set his eyes on the Messiah, and Peter was giving off the pleasing aroma of Mashiach. And therefore, his physical body became lighter than water, allowing him to be able to walk on water. Finally, in a lights out situation, those who have been abiding in the house of Yahuwah would not be afraid of being in the dark, for our eyes have been trained to see in the dark. It's almost like we've been given night vision capabilities. And how do you gain that? We are to be baptized. We are to be immersed in Mashiach's spirit and fire. It is through that immersion that we triangulate with our Mashiach and light the lamp of Yahuwah in us, making us the light of the world. And as we let our light shine to everyone, and as we let our light shine to those who are sitting in silence and darkness, they see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. And so we have become fit vessels for the Master's use. And now taking this a step further, can being light make us light enough to be able to meet our Mashiach in the air? Think about this. The heat produced by the light of our Messiah expands the air around us, making us less dense than the air surrounding us. And so hot air is less dense than cold air. So the hot air floats in the more denser air, just like how ice floats 
on water, just like how clouds are made up of liquid crystallines that give its formation, just like how hot air balloons float upwards as if it were in water because of the hot air rising. And by heating the air inside the balloon with the burner, it becomes lighter than the cooler air on the outside. Picture a menorah inside our hearts. And since we have Mashiach in our hearts, my question is, are you being immersed by our Messiah's Ruach and fire so that we can light each and every branch of the menorah? And with the heat produced out of the menorah being lit makes us lighter, less dense than the cold air that surrounds us, that makes us light enough to float and be able to meet our master in the air. We're not carrying any heavy burdens. We are not yoked into the hardship of this world. My heart's intent in sharing the dream that my daughter has is to bring comfort to strengthen you with these words just as Paul encourages us and comforts us with 1 Thessalonians 4 17 then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet our master in the air and thus we shall always be with him until next time be still and know the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. <laughs>